Josiah said to us. O seer, go. Flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethlehem. For it is the king's sanctuary. And it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah. Excited to get back to New Orleans. Um, I lived there before Katrina, and then after Katrina, I led six trips back down to do um, to do work post post uh, Hurricane Katrina and Rita. And I became an expert at hanging drywall. I did. I did. I did. And I became an expert because I had experience you know, in such things.
sense to us, the perfect example of how to live a faithful life in his son, um, who lived, died, and rose again so that we may be assured of the promises of God. We may be assured that God will always whisper words of correction to us. That we may be assured that Christ will always put us back in line, back on the path. We, will, we, all, we can always be assured that the Spirit This is what he, God, showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again Pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go. Flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. You may be seated. So early tomorrow morning, uh, a group of us will be leaving, uh, a group of us from here and, and St. Paul Waldo are leaving for New Orleans. And we're going to be part of 18,000 Lutherans, adults and youth, in the city of New Orleans for the National Youth Gathering. 18,000 high schoolers is my fortune this week. <laughs> right? right? Woohoo! Pray, brothers and sisters, pray. Uh, no, it's, it's, for me, it's going to be good to get back to New Orleans. Um, it's been 14 years since I was last in the city of New Orleans. Um, in 2001, I lived there for a while. 
And then post uh, Katrina and Rita, I led six trips down uh, to do hurricane relief work um, for the city that I love and once called home. So it's going to be good to get back to a place I've called home before. And um, it's in that place, New Orleans, that I became an expert in hanging drywall. Right? We did a lot of hanging of drywall. And I was expert because of my previous life experience. You see, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. That's the era of wallpaper. Right? And my mother loved wallpaper, and my father liked hanging it. And so I got drafted into doing wallpaper. Now, I remember the first time we hung wallpaper together. It was in the downstairs basement. It was a half bath, right? Pretty small, pretty tight. And um, it was, now you're going, this is immediately going to come back to your memory. It was that red, velvet, swirly, scrolly, some of you may still have it, right? Right, and you had to matchy matchy, right? <laughs> you did, right? And so we started. Now, I, I could never tell my father um, how to do things, and so we started at the door, right? And we just matchy matchy, right? By the time we got behind the toilet, um, it was so jacked up that we had to cut these crazy pieces, you know, to matchy-matchy. And then mom came in, and she, the wrath of mother hit when she turned the light on and saw the job we did. Because we failed to use a what? A plumb line. We thought we could do it ourselves. And then after that, I became very adept at a plumb line, Right? So I'd climb up on the chair, and we'd hang it, and I'd, right? And I'd usually try to hit Dad in the head, but I, right? Accidents happen, right? And then you put it together, and you pluck it, and then it gives you the line, and then you, you, just, you line it up. And the same thing is true with drywall. So my previous experience, I did the same thing with drywall, right, in New Orleans, right? Because you see a plumb line, the vertical line is to ensure, to make sure that the horizontal is true. You with me? Because to test the vertical, you use a level. That tells you if the vertical's true. A plumb is to make sure the horizontal is true. God sends Amos, a southerner. Now, he's from the southern kingdom, from Tekoa, which is about 12 miles south of Jerusalem. So he's a southern boy. And he says, you go to the north. That's the northern kingdom, right? The south is Judah, north is Israel. This is after the split, after Solomon. And you go tell them, they're not doing so good, and I'm going to destroy them. Now, Amos was not a prophet. He tells you that. Even when he gets called out, he says, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son. I, I, I was just a guy who uh, plucked sycamore trees and had a flock. And God told me to come up here. Right? And, and what does he say? This is actually, when we get to chapter 7 of Amos, the third vision that God lays on Amos to prophesy to Israel. Now, in the first two visions, God gives Amos a vision tells Israel, Israel kind of makes some opportunities to change, and God changes God's mind and doesn't destroy them. That is not true with this third vision. God dooms them in this. He sets the plum. He says, I am going to set a plum in the midst of the people Israel to see if their horizontal is true, Right? And if it's not, I'm going to lay waste to it. Well, Jeroboam II, we know historically, reigned until uh, 744 BCE. Four years later, in 740 BCE, the Assyrians enter into Israel, 
and take it over. And in less than a generation, in 722, the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed. They become the ten lost tribes of Israel, are scattered to the wind, and never exist again ever in history. Because God put them to the plumb, and they were not true. God drops a plum on us, brothers and sisters, to see if we are true. Um, I struggled yesterday as news came out, as good Christians or just good people of faith, we should have been praying for the former president and his family for the other victims and their families, for everybody that was there and their families. That's a traumatic experience to go through. Right? Um, some of you know, for the last three years, I've been working with uh, Secret Service, which includes some of the people that were there yesterday. And so they came to mind as I prayed for them and their families. We're doing a very difficult job, and we should have been praying for our country. But yet, as the evening wore on, very quickly, we became ridiculous in the things we were saying. We as a nation. Right? On both ends. Right? Should have had better aim. That's what some people were saying. Correct? Should have been the current one. Right? Oh, he's staging it all. Oh, the current president is the one that's behind it. And everything in between is what we were saying. And God dropped a plum on us yesterday. Amen. To see if we are true. We pledge one nation under God. God's going to drop a plum to see how we're doing. We say, God bless America. Well, God's going to determine whether God blesses America based on the plum that God drops in our midst. And if we go by the example of the kingdom of Israel, we had better start getting it together. That's the fact testify that's what Amos is saying today God is continually dropping a plum in our midst to see if we are doing what we should be doing right dropping a plum to see if our horizontal is true right our horizontal is how we get along with each other you see in the Bible there is no individual judgment you are judged as a community God judges the entire nation of Israel, the entire kingdom. Not Jeroboam and Amaziah, the king and the high priest, but everybody. Because we're in this together. Our judgment will be together, not individual, as God drops a plum in our midst. And we've got a lot of work to do. Right? Hopefully, my prayer this morning is that this is one of the first two visions <laughs> that Isaiah got where we have an opportunity to change, where we pay attention to what God is saying, right? God sends prophets in our midst to call us into question, right? Because many times when we're, when we're uh, you know, it's just like being in the bathroom with my father, standing in the midst of it, I couldn't see how off we were. It took my mother to be the plum. <laughs> Wasn't the only time in my life she was that, served that purpose, right? To tell me how off I was, right? Took a stranger that isn't in the midst to drop the plum to see whether we're true or not, right? Same is true in congregations. God drops a plum 
in the midst of Emanuel Lutheran Church in Marion, Ohio. And we're going to find out how we're doing. <laughs> God's going to tell us. Right? In how we treat one another. That's the horizontal. How we speak to one another. How we act with one another. How we treat our neighbors. Right? The decisions we make. The way we do things. God drops a plum in our midst. And I hope we listen to what God has to say. Because you see, God dropped the ultimate plum for us. The ultimate plum line. Because the horizontal, or the vertical, shows that the horizontal is true. That's that's the message of the cross, right? If we're loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, then we are loving our neighbors as ourselves. If we are following God's commandments, then we'll do what God calls us to do. If, if we are building God's kingdom, we will live a kingdom life. God gives us the ultimate example in Christ of what it means to be true. In fact, Jesus even says, I am the way, the... and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. We have an opportunity to get right, to get true, to make the changes necessary to bring the kingdom of God here on earth today. That is what God expects us to do. And God believes we can do it. And, and as a sign of believing we can do it, God's going to always drop a plum in us to show us how we're doing so that we can change. Right? God will give us the opportunity to change. That is the promise of the cross. God will give us the power to do the right thing. That is the promise of the cross. God will inspire us with visions of what the kingdom is supposed to look like. That is the promise of the cross. And so what we are called to do is to continually fix our wallpaper. <laughs> right? To matchy-matchy the little red scrolls until it is the most beautiful uh, surrounding that we could ever imagine. Until we are one people living in peace and harmony. Working against the answer of violence and hate. Christ came to give us the example. In the, on the trip, um, if you've picked up a bracelet, right? Everybody picked up their little bracelets. Because if you don't take them today, i got to haul them down to New Orleans. So take the bracelets, right? The bracelets say what? Whoever's got one. What does it say on them? Right, right. Well, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's the cross. That means seeing the blood of Christ in every person in this world. That means placing others before ourselves. That means doing the work of the kingdom even when it's not what we want to do. That's what Jesus would do. And so we get to go out into the world and be part of building God's creation. Uh, one face, one action, one life at a time. So that when God sets the plum in our midst for that final decision that we'll go through together. God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. I could ask those going on the trip to New Orleans for the youth gathering to come forward as well. So.
gathering people if you want to just stand at the bottom and face everybody. Dun, 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 dun. And then you guys get to stand behind them. Oh, this is magic. You can stand behind them on the steps. Behind. You got it. You, we'll work it out. You guys can go behind. You in front? You're in front. What's up, bro? You ready? Yeah, yeah, stand up. Okay. Come on up. What's that? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> he stands out. Okay. So what you guys are going to do in the back, you're going to lay hands on them. So kind of space yourself out. Space out. And then put your, just lay one hand on a shoulder, one hand on a shoulder. There you go. And you can put another one, and you can put, you can put your hands, and you can put your hands on there. So everybody's got your hands on, right? Okay. Can you feel that? Okay. Now, what we get to do is we're going to, you can put your hand out. Okay. We're going to bless them as we go. Put your hands out. Put your hands out. There you go. All right. So this is the blessing that uh, was sent to us from the youth gathering uh, to, to do for today to everybody going, right? Um, a blessing for your travel to the ELCA Youth Gathering. God, our creator, since the beginning, you declared that we were created to be very good. As we prepare for our journey to New Orleans, we call upon your brave spirit to be with us. In times when we have doubts about ourselves or feeling insecure about who we are, remind us that we are created to be authentic bringing our whole selves to whatever we are called to be. As we gather, may we be transformed by the power of your liberation, knowing that Jesus has come to set us to be free. Equip us to be disruptive. Freed by the gospel, we will strive to work for justice and peace. Send us now into the world to be your disciples, agents of your love, hope, and reconciliation. For you have called us and created us for such a time as this. Amen. Can we offer just a round of thanksgiving and cheer and for, um, so in one of those moments of coming full circle, right, um, 21 years ago, when I was an intern, I went with a group from Emmanuel Lutheran Church because I was serving the uh, three parishes in the county. And we got this necklace on the last day. They gave everybody this necklace. And this is the sending that was on the back that goes with this necklace. So I'm going to send you out with this, with this sending. Is that fair? Right? And, um, and it says, Child of God, you are molded by God, marked by Christ, moved by the Holy Spirit, and made to be God's hands and feet in the world. And I look forward to, uh, to this um, next week with you all. So it's going to be fun and good food and good fun and good work for the kingdom. So can we offer up again as they go? Go ahead. You can go back. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. gospel according to St. Mark beginning in the 6th chapter King Herod heard of it for Jesus name had become known some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead and for this reason these powers are at work in him but others said it is Elijah and others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. 
For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's right. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, tomorrow morning, the group that was standing here leave to be part of 18,000 ELCA Lutherans in, in New Orleans. 18,000. Um, it's going to be a blast. Um, and I'm very excited to, uh, to go with them to, uh, to a place that I once called home. Right? Uh, 2001, I lived there. And, uh, and then after Katrina and Rita, I led six mission trips back to New Orleans, right? Actually, it's been 14 years since I've been in the city. So it'll be good to be back and enjoy home once again. Um, yeah, and it was in the city of New Orleans that I became an expert at hanging drywall, right? Right, the hurricane relief, man, you... You hang some drywall, and I became an expert at it. Some of it because we did it so much, but I had had some previous life experience to help me hang drywall. You see, I grew up, like many of you, some of you, in the 60s and 70s, when everybody was putting up wallpaper. And my mother loved wallpaper and commanded my father to put it up. Commanded. <laughs> and then my father would voluntold me how I was going to help. And the first time, I still remember the first time we hung wallpaper. It was, it was in our downstairs basement. It was a half bath, kind of a small bathroom, right? And um, so we started out at the door, right? And we, and, and now you're going to picture this immediately, right? This wallpaper was the relieved red velvet squirrely scroll thing. Y'all with me? How many still got that in their house? <laughs> At least not visible, right? Right, so that's what we were doing in that, in that bathroom. And we started, right? Because you had to matchy-matchy, right? You got to matchy-matchy, and you matchy-matchy, and then you got over the sink. And then by the time we got behind the toilet, it was a train wreck, <laughs> Right? And, and we were all jacked up and we were cutting these funky pieces to matchy matchy, right? To make it complete. And then my mother wanted to see the work. 
And she walked in, and I suggested she not turn the light on. But she did anyway. <laughs> and we received the wrath of my mother as she saw what we had done. You see, what we had failed to utilize was a what? A plumb line. Right? We failed to use a plumb. Now, the next time we did it, which was very shortly after to fix the bathroom, right? We used a plumb line, right? Cause you, and I would get up on the chair and I'd put it up and you drop it to fish, right now. Pluck it and it makes a little line and then you line it up. Everybody with me, right? Dropping a plumb line. It was because of that life experience of years and years and rolls and rolls of wallpaper that I knew how to hang drywall, right? I knew how to drop a plumb and I knew how to make things right, right? Um, because what you learn is it's the vertical line that makes the horizontal true, right? You drop a vertical line so that the horizontal is right. If you want to fix the vertical, you use a level, right? Everybody with me so far? Right? The plumb, the vertical line, makes sure horizontal is true. God says to Amos, I'm going to drop a plumb line in the midst of the kingdom of Israel to just see if they are true. Right? I'm going to drop this vertical line to check the trueness of the horizontal. How are they doing? Right? Now, this uh, uh, Amos 7 that we heard from today is actually the third vision in the book of Amos. In the first two visions, right, God sends Amos. Amos is a southern boy. He's from Tekoa, which is 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Right? And he comes to the northern kingdom in, in Bethel. Right? In the north. Remember, the kingdoms of Split. So he's, 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 not a, he's not a northerner, he's a southerner. And God sends him to go up and tell Jeroboam, who's the king, Jeroboam II, and Amaziah, who's the high, pri uh, high priest in the north, you've got to change your ways. You don't, you're not true. And the first two visions they kind of, uh, that, that Amos gives to them, they kind of make a little changes or at least make it look like they're making changes. And God, who said, if you don't change, I'll destroy you, changes God's mind and doesn't destroy them in the first two visions. That's not true in this third one. God does not change God's mind. Right? And says, if you, if you do not make yourself true, when I drop the plum in the midst of you, I will destroy you and you will disappear forever. because you didn't follow my ways. Well, Jeroboam II reigned until 744 BCE. In 740, Assyria takes over the kingdom of Israel. And within a generation, at 722 BCE, north of Israel is destroyed. They are, the people are scattered to the four winds. They become the ten lost tribes of Israel and there is no sense of them ever again because they didn't make themselves true when God showed them with the plum how off they were. Interesting fact in all scripture, right? In all of scripture, it is never an individual judgment. Judgment is always on the community as a whole. Even though it may have only been Jeremiah and Amaziah who were out of bounds, judgment fell to the whole kingdom together. Throughout Scripture, we are told that our judgment will be collective. It'll be us that are judged, not individually. Right? And that's true throughout all of Scripture. Jesus comes and says the same thing um, uh, to the people. He, he, uh, he prophesies to, to change, to repent, right? 
God drops plumb lines in our midst. I began to fear yesterday. as news began to spread of what was happening. In a time when good Christians should have been praying for our former president and his family, elected officials and, and their families were the victims of uh, the other victims that were shot and their families, for the people that were all there in this traumatic experience and their families. Some of you know I work with the Secret Service including some of the ones that were there in Pennsylvania yesterday. And I began to pray deeply for them and their families and our country as a whole. But then very quickly, you started to hear what was being said that really disturbed me. I should have stopped looking, but I didn't. Right? Right. Should have had better aim. I mean, testify, right? I'm not making this up. Should have been the current one. Right? He staged this as a, as a ploy. It's the current guy that's doing this. And everything in between. And I'm like, holy mackerel. Is that where we are as a nation? Has our hate and violence and just distaste for humanity brought us to this? And I prayed that God would not drop a plumb line last night. Because if so, we're in a world of hurt. Right? If we're going to pledge one nation under God, God's going to drop a plumb line and see how we're doing. If we're going to say, God bless America, well, God's going to drop a plumb line to decide if God should bless America or not. And I think we should worry. All right? How will we be in our trueness if God drops a plumb line today? Scary. Right? That's what Amos is saying to us today. God will drop plumb lines and we will all endure judgment together based on the totality of it all. And, and um, hopefully my prayer today and has been since last night that God, that maybe this is one of the first two visions <laughs> where we have a chance to change and not the third where our destiny is set. Right? Because God has sent the ultimate plumb line into our midst. Because it's the vertical that shows that the horizontal is true. If we are loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we are doing what? Say it. Loving our neighbors as ourselves. If we are following God's commandments, then we will do what God commands us to do. If, if we, uh, you know, if, if we are doing the work of the kingdom, the kingdom of God will become present in the here and now. That's our plumb line. That's the message of the cross. Right? We were given the ultimate example of what that looks like. To be true to God. Right? Um, <laughs> First Deacon Ann announced, if, if you haven't got a bracelet, grab one. Because if you don't, we have to haul them to New Orleans. <laughs> and I don't know how packed the van is right now. Right? What does the bracelet say? WWJD. What would Jesus do? You see, it's calling ourselves to, with every breath we take to put our lives to the plumb.
to the example of Christ. Right? God drops a plum in the midst of congregations. Including Lutheran Church in Marion, Ohio. How well do we treat each other? How do we speak to one another? How do we act with one another? What are we doing for the kingdom? How are we doing the ministry? Is it in accordance with God's wishes and God's will and God's command and God's kingdom? Or is it the rules that we make up for ourselves? Because God will drop a plum in our midst. Promises to do it. we are, the promise of the cross is that we are given an opportunity to make the changes necessary to be true, right? The matchy-matchy, the little swirly red velvet scrolls until that time when everything is the most beautiful wallpaper you could ever imagine in this world. We are given the ability through the power of the cross to look into the eyes of everyone we encounter and see the blood of Christ first and only. We are given the power of the Holy Spirit to have the tools to change this world into the kingdom of God. The question is, how close to true are we? So as we go out from here today, um, know that you carry the plum with you, right? To always check yourself. See, part of the difficulty in that bathroom decades ago, we're in the midst of it, of that room. And what we needed, we couldn't see how bad we were. Sometimes we need someone from the outside to show us differently to give us a plum, to put us to the test. So we can go out into the world and show the world what we need to do to be better, to follow God's ways, to be God's love, to embrace the world until it becomes the kingdom that God desires for this world from all creation. And we can do it. Because you see, the one who is the plum is also the way, the truth, and the life, and promises to be with us to the end of the age so that we can do what we need to do. And it just starts today.